Hello and welcome to the Lively Faith Podcast. I am your host, the Reverend Nathan Stomberg, and today I am joined by my ministry partner, the Reverend Mark Galloway. And today we're going to be talking about living with chronic illness. Now wait just a second. For those of you who may be our audio listeners and are listening back and forth between audio and YouTube, you may be asking yourself, well, I thought Corey was in the episode on chronic illness, and he was. But we unfortunately fell into some technical difficulties and have to re-record the video for this episode. So hopefully it will be all that the last episode was and more. And for anyone who's a super fan out there, well, go ahead and listen to both (laughs) and you might find some bonus content hidden inside. So let's jump right in. Like we said last time, this is not medical advice. We're not medical professionals. We're really talking about personal experience here. It is spiritual advice, and that is ultimately our goal, as it is with all of our conversations, to get to the spiritual element and to find the encouragement of the gospel in these things. So I'll start with a question for you, Mark. As much as you're comfortable, can you describe your condition to our viewers? Uh, Well, I have been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. It's a variation of it. Um, whenever I say that, people always say, oh, yeah, my uncle and my aunt has Parkinson's, and assuming that it's this uniform thing. And Parkinson's is uh, more of really a, a catch term in neuroscience. And Parkinson's is, it, it's really neurological damage to your spinal column. Your um, it doesn't get to your brain, to your muscles, and all of that type of thing. And mine uh, was induced by trauma. Uh, and I was in a car accident. I was hit by, I was standing uh, still in my car to turn left, and I was hit at 55 miles an hour by a young lady who wasn't paying attention, and, um, and my life changed in an instant. Um, I was in a semi-coma for several months um, from that. And it wasn't until weeks and months later that uh, the extrapolation of what really had happened to me was, was able to be ciphered and through. And uh, took a long time to figure out. It really took um, six years before I got diagnosed with this variation of Parkinson's, which is called stiff man syndrome, hmm. which is that... You know, the muscles, because of the damage in the spinal column, are just getting incrementally over time tighter and tighter and tighter. And that's exactly what is happening uh, to me. So that's the big crux of it. But almost simultaneously to uh, the Parkinson's um, or the car accident, uh, well, six months leading up to that, I started having all these syndromes where I was having uh, all kinds of difficulty. Uh, at the time, I was running uh, a lot, like 50 miles a week. I was very fit. And all of a sudden, like within a month or two, I couldn't run a couple miles or anything. And uh, I, was, it was, uh, I had this fog, fatigue, um, and I went through a whole long process for that. And I was diagnosed with POTS syndrome, which is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is uh, another neurological disorder where your brain isn't getting the right messages and your blood pressure collapses, drops, and uh, gives you vertigo or you pass <clears throat> out. And so so uh, that was going on simultaneously uh, or even before the accident. And then they, they worked themselves out simultaneously. So... And, and neither one's cure, there's no cure to pot syndrome. And uh, I'm even luckier because pot syndrome is predominantly happens in adolescent girls, but only 2% of men get it. Wow. And, and um, even less. So there's only, uh, in my age bracket, there's only about 2,500 people in North America with with pod syndrome you really hit the lottery yeah, didn't I mean, you I hit a home run with that so um 
And there's, there's a third piece to my life, which we, I, I don't want to go this rabbit hole, but it's, it's something that's being monitored and, uh, my sister and I are going to probably part of a, um, a project at Butler's because my father died of Alzheimer's. And when he died, it was determined that he, he died, we call it double gene, which means his father died when he was young, uh, never knew his father. But his mother died of Alzheimer's. But through studies, they found out that his father would have died of Alzheimer's, hmm. or if he didn't die of something else. So, because my father has a double gene, that means that his children have a two-third chance of having a double gene. So, this there's always this monitoring of symptoms going on, and it's something you, you really have to learn to live with when you have a high propensity that you're going to have something that's as uh, uncomfortable in common discussions in our culture yeah. this day as something like Alzheimer's. So I'm a bit of a unique a combination of three things going on simultaneously. But the dominant thing in my life is, is the effect of the Parkinson's and the POTS. They just are, it's just a daily struggle. It affects everything, everything of your life. You know, yeah. my back just doesn't work. I had two back surgeries to try to do some corrective stuff. Spinal ablations. Uh, I did it Beth Israel, maybe the most famous. Spinal hospital. ablation. Can you explain that? Yeah, it's, um, it's really the, you, um, you, you're only like semi out, but they, they go up your back and then the needles this long. <laughs> and it's literally this long as two of them is a scope on it. And right. And they're going up your spinal column right from the bottom of your buttocks, right up to the top of your spinal column, and then they they look for nerve endings that they can burn that they guesstimate might be mm. part of the problem. And it's it's really intense. Uh, it's like a 40 second, um, each one is like 40 seconds, and they do about a dozen or two dozen on the, the one side of your column, then the next time they do the other. And it's about a 15 second, uh, Span where you're going, I can't take that any longer, but then it passes, and then you have to gird yourself for the next, mm. and so forth. But they didn't, I went through that twice, and it didn't have any effect. And, and the, the odds were they weren't, but it was worth doing. But I wouldn't suggest to do that for kicks. It's, no. <laughs> it's, it's, it's no, um, so yeah, my life, um, went from being, you, you know me, Josh knows me, um, Incredibly active, athletic, my whole life. Went to college on scholarship, athletic scholarship, and was in, and I, my life just changed on a dime when I was. Um, it's eleven years ago, in July. This accident happened. Wow. I'm forty-eight years old. So, what was that adjustment like for you? It was very difficult, um, and it was at the it was at the height of my. Um, Ecclesiastical vocation, right? Uh, as a bishop of, of a fellowship of Anglicans in Rhode Island, and uh, a lot of responsibility, and all of a sudden, I was just out of work for um, from July. I went back in February, and I wasn't really ready to go back, but there was a lot of anxiety in the fellowships about your absent, right? And I never ever got back. To where I was physically, obviously, but also there, there's cognitive trailers to these things. There's other things that follow neurological damage, and um, so I worked uh, through two fifth August of two fifteen. But uh, by the beginning of two thousand fifteen, I realized uh, somebody else could do better at my job than I I could do at that point. Mm -hmm. I felt it was the morally the best thing is to is to uh, retire, and resign, and let a more able man uh, take that office. And so it was a very difficult time. It's it's still difficult. I I haven't um, in my mind's eye. I'm still uh, I'm still this active young person that can do whatever yeah. he wanted physically, you know. And it's, and I'm anything but that. And that's uh, very frustrating. You know, I, 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 I had kind of an Indian summer with you. That's a right. A couple of years ago, I was able to run and, and actually do very well in my age bracket. But uh, last year, as this disease does, all of a sudden my left leg just stopped working to the point where I couldn't even walk on it for 
several months, and uh, just in the last three weeks, I've been able to walk on it again to on an irregular basis. So, yeah, it's very difficult. But um, through it all, I constantly remind myself that I have to live what I've preached for for my life. Is yeah. that there's nothing unique about my life. Suffering's part of not just the Christian's journey, it's the part of any human being's journey. And, and I would argue without faith, rootedness in the gospel, you can't even put up suffering in the right perspective. Suffering's just going to happen in life. And you've heard me teach and say it many times in sermons, life's not a suffering contest. And there's nothing more um, I find displeasurable than listen to people who want to advertise their suffering so they can be a champion victim because it doesn't get you anywhere in life. Uh, whatever it is that afflicts you, and something will afflict you in life, uh, whether it's physical or emotional or, or anything or combinations thereof, there's two things you can do in life. You can quit yep, or you can keep going. And, exactly. And the latter, it seems to me, is the only option because the former just leads to despair and really spiritual death and all the other physical things that come with it. Yeah. I want to go back to what you said about there being nothing unique with suffering in the human experience and relating that to the transition from your life before your diagnosis and your life after. There's definitely a mourning process that goes on for your life before and the specifics of your situation are unique, but certainly that mourning process is something that everyone has to go through at some point, if not multiple times throughout different seasons of their lives. Absolutely. It's like the aging process itself. Right? Yeah. And, uh, uh, and it's, it's just not you. It affects all these concentric circles in your life. There's mourning. My wife had mourning for herself mm -hmm. and for me. Uh, because I wasn't the person I used to be. It changed my, my kids. Uh, were in their teens when um, this accident happened. So they lived through their 20s w with a father who went from being this hyperactive person to being a person that had extreme limited limit abilities. Yeah. Right? And so um, th there's all these adjustments that have to go on. You know, my, my mother and my siblings and so forth. It changes an entire aspect of family dynamics when... Uh, a central component of a, a family all of a sudden has this chronic problem. And um, but it, the, the morning is very real. It's, uh, I, I, I don't think you ever, you don't ever get complete victory over it. You, you have to be keep, it, it's like, a, it's like an addiction or anything else that you mm. battle, right? You, you have to always be, I mean, I just don't wake up every morning and go, yes, yeah, it's another day of Parkinson's. I just, I'm psyched, right? It, that's just a lie. It's like, all right, you got to deal with it. This is this is today. It may be a good day. It may be a not so good day as far as the symptoms go. But um, trying to stay um, ahead of it emotionally now that only can be done, in my opinion, through faith. Yeah, and through grace and realizing. Otherwise, you're going to fall into this victim, this this whole victim um, paradigm that dominates the world. You know. Yeah. I want to return to that, but I want to finish this train of thought first. When we're talking about staying ahead of it emotionally and spiritually, can you speak to any sort of routine that you might have, both on a practical level, but also on a spiritual level, whether it's prayer life or, or anything else for that matter, just like a day-by-day -day sort of explanation? Yeah, right, yes. And I, the first priority has to be the spiritual piece. Because the second part, the physical part, is unpredictable. Yeah. Right. So you can say, you know, I'm going to do this. You know, people can say physical therapy, or you go to the gym, or you do whatever you can of stretching, or whatever amounts of exercise you can do. And when you have this, you have to press. You have to. You have to exercise as much as you possibly can, hmm. because if you don't use muscles, you're going to lose them. Right. Because you're losing them anyway. So it, it just it. Uh, you're going to lose them a lot faster if you're not as active as possible. But uh, clearly, like anything for a Christian, uh, the, the first priority in your life and your day has to be giving glory to God, right? And otherwise, you're going to have a misinformed perspective on everything that you're going to be 
uh, attempting to do in life. So, um, yeah, and you had to be able to find joy in the day. You know, as you know, as the, the scriptures say, rejoice always, you know, uh, unspeakable joy in, in Christ, no matter what circumstance. And that's what the saints teach us. That's, uh, you know, some of our heroes, you and I talk about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, right? To, yeah. You know, he's in the middle of, of a Nazi concentration camp and he's sharing the gospel and living this joyous life right up to the time he goes to the scaffolding. So yeah. we're capable of greatness, even in our limitations as, as human beings, but specifically as Christians because of the grace and the infinite love of God that's always available to us. So, um, yeah, I, the, the second part is important, but it gets overemphasized, right? Because there's always, there's always people, uh, just this week, uh, every week this happens to me, they're like, Mark, have you tried this, right? Everyone's got the secret for you. You, you know the, the the vitamin things that Frank Thomas pushes? You ever heard Nugenics? Yeah, yeah, I've yeah, heard of those. So this guy goes to me and goes, if you, hey, man, have you thought about Nugenics? I'm like, I go, they're not, none of that stuff's real. <laughs> <laughs> right, and I'm like, here's the bottom line about both Potts and Parkinson's. They're not curable, and then, then they go, well, you never know. I go, no, we know. It's like the sun comes up in the east and it goes yeah. down in the west. It's not curable, so it's not healthy for a person with that type of chronic situation to be taking that type of advice or even putting their hope in it's false hope. Yeah, it, it's, instead of dealing with reality, trusting God, and taking what you have making the best of it um, it's not easy but that's what we're called to do especially as believers in our suffering we're giving witness to the power of God in us what what we're really about and uh, uh, unfortunately in 30 years as a priest uh, I uh, I can say I've watched a lot of people who claim to be Christians and everything's wonderful until things go dead wrong in their lives, and all of a sudden, all this Christian virtue and uh, belief just kind of dissipates. Goes out the window. It does, right? And it's like, uh, did you ever really have it? Uh, if, if your faith is all about thinking God's great when everything goes the way you want it, then you don't really understand the will of God and that God's sovereign, and that you're small and God's big, right? And life's short and eternity's long. Um, all of these are things, as you well know as a pastor, very few people want to hear in life. Like St. Paul says, I consider these present afflictions but a light momentary suffering. Yeah, yeah. I think at times, uh, I mean, you want to think you're, I don't want to say a hero, but you, you, you want to think you're being a, really uh, an example that people find um, courage in and, and encouragement in and so forth. I've, I've actually found that in some ways, they find it annoying because they want to be victims. And even in, in, in contexts where they're suffering a lot less, mm. right? Lots and of times, sociological suffering or economic suffering or whatever. All the reasons everybody has a GoFundMe page in, in the whole country, right? And they're like, oh, I know what he's going to say. He's going to say, you've got to suck it up and believe in Jesus. Yeah, I am. Would you say that you probably spend a lot of your time trying to make other people feel better about your condition more so than you? Um, yeah, yeah, to some extent. I, I, I just think chronic illness of, of this magnitude just scares people. Right? And so they want, they want it to be some other alternative to, than to the reality. And so I think it's more you minister, you const I'm constantly ministering to people yeah. about reality. Uh, and in that, you're right, end up comforting them. Like, you know, you're patent, you know, you're like, it's okay. It's okay, I yeah. have Parkinson's, as, as opposed to they're like, because they're not at a place in their faith journey they can deal with it. They can't deal with most of life, never mind uh, something of that magnitude. And it goes back to what you were saying about the mourning process, where you're mourning the transition that you've gone through in your life. Other people also have to mourn the image and the idea of who you were to them and who you are now, as we all do with many of our other loved ones as they go through seasons of life. And when you see someone you love going through a season of suffering, 
it's a reminder that that same can happen to you and it's a reminder that that image of that person in your head is no longer the reality yeah yeah i was saying to you i was at a a, a reunion last night a fundraiser reunion where these guys i ran with for decades some of them i hadn't seen for a long time and they they didn't really know how to deal with a lot of it you know they're like oh man that's just so awful and and i'm like no it's not no you know, it's life and so forth and you know must be terrible you know that's always must be terrible yeah like no well, it's not the most preferential way to life but no it's not terrible there's hundreds of millions of people in far worse situations than i'm ever going to experience so it's always perspective with this um I, I I always I've read it many a time. Uh, an Anglican priest from the 17th century, really one of the premier Anglican divines of his time, Jeremy Taylor. And he wrote two books, and they've really become classics in Anglicanism and Western Christian tradition. And his first book was The Rules and Exercise of Holy Living. He wrote in 1650. The next year, he wrote a book. The Rules and Exercise of Holy Dying. Mm. And, and those are the two keys to the whole Christian experience. We live holy because we believe in a thrice holy God who is our Savior and is going to be our judge. And we want to live our lives in a way that leads us to holy dying. Perhaps nothing's more powerful there is nothing more powerful than how you deal with dying. And unfortunately, we live in a culture that is so pagan and is so off its moorings about death. Uh, you were sharing with me the other day in Canada, what was the percentage of Canadians, 8% or? Of... Yeah, so for the context for our viewers and listeners, Canada has, over the last couple of years, instituted a new well, program, for lack of a better word, called Medical Assistance in Dying, M-A-I-D, call it MAID for short. It's quite the euphemism, yeah. as it were. Of course, they took up the term medical assistance in dying because medically assisted suicide was too much of a trigger. So assistance in dying makes it sound much softer. So this program, MAID in Canada, has obviously had horribly detrimental effects. The way the legislation is written, it's very broad, and there are very few guardrails put up against who can pursue this course of, of action, this course of death. And the big controversy recently has been that they recently, they postponed it, but a decision to expand the MAID program to those who are undergoing mental illness, which, of course, you can presume where that's going to go. It's a very slippery slope. But the statistic that you were referencing is that in the province of Quebec, it came out that nearly 8% of all deaths in that province are through medically assisted suicide. So not just people with terminal illness, but all deaths. You just want to check out people just choosing to check out and it comes back to this idea of that the sad idea of radical individual autonomy where we have a right to choose when we leave this world and of course that's the ideology being pushed by the politicians and this isn't to belittle the plight of these people who are undergoing real suffering because they're being fed this messaging that you are you're a burden, you're expensive, and you're useless. And so who hasn't felt that at some point, especially people who are suffering from depression and how evil it is to oh, make... Absolutely. So that, devaluing of life, right? Yeah. That somehow all these categories that you can create, and you, you know there's going to be all these subcategories, that, and just the beautiful people will be deciding who's valuable. And uh, it, it's so illogical right you don't determine how you come into the world so why should you have any right to determine exactly. when you leave the world right. and it's so godless it's 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 just this whole um vanishing or purposely ignoring 
disbelieving in the whole Judeo-Christian understanding of creation and who, who, that human beings are the pinnacle of God's image in right. the entire universe. And that it's just saying God's providence for your life is wrong. I know what I'm doing or some bureaucrat knows what I know much better. Do. Right. When you lose the image of God over the next few years rapidly, you'll see the bounds of this ideology shrink in on itself because the guardrails have come off. So at the start of life, obviously, we have the terrible tragedy of abortion and restrictions being lifted on it all the way up through birth and even to the moments after birth. And now you'll see on the other end of people's lifespans, the criteria for medically assisted suicide expanding from those with terminal illness to those with incurable suffering to those <laughs> where now it's much more financially um, Driv beneficial, driven, and it's much more financially effective to have someone undergo medically assisted suicide than for them to be a quote unquote burden on the system to pay to get them the right treatment, to make them feel yeah. better, to support their lives for X number of years through the medical establishment. It's just downright evil, right? There's all of these forces are going on simultaneously, abortion, right? Um, and then we, we, want, we, we literally are creating policies that want to encourage people to kill themselves. Right, and meanwhile, we have no children. The birth rate in America just went under two for the first time ever. Right? Yeah. Uh, which means you can't even replace yourself. And I don't know who these progressives thinks are even going to be alive. Wh who's even going to be? Where are people even going to come from? Right? They're aborted. They're not born. Birth rates down. And now we're going to check people out as soon as whatever the uh, for a hangnail or for whatever. And. Uh, uh, the whole progressive mindset is like mental illness. It, it literally is, because it, it so makes no logical sense. Like, in civilization, you have to have people, you have to people who work, people who are productive, people who pay taxes so that you can actually have all these services. And the things that they believe in and support actually uh, promote just the opposite of what they're going to need to have a civilization. And so, As if it has no consequences and no means to an end. What we're dealing with and what we're looking at is a systematic rejection of God's plan, good plan for humanity at every single step along the human life cycle. Absolutely, yeah. You know, the, the irony about the whole word euthanasia, right? You means good. Euthanasia means death. And... Here's, here's these people telling, this is a good death for you, right? And, and it's like, it's like, uh, it's, it's very similar to the cause and effect in the concentric outlying domino effect of, of suicide in, in families' lives. You, euthanasia, right? You're so consumed with yourself. You don't think there's going to be long-term effects when you decide to check out uh, for whatever reason. And so let's say you're 85 and you have chronic cancer or you're Parkinson's or ALS, whatever, and you decide you're out, right? Well, what do you teach the next generation about how to deal with anything in life? And it, of course, what's going to happen, and it's already happening, is that the checkout point is going to be coming about less and less serious things with every ensuing generation. And it's going to end up encroaching earlier and earlier in the human lifespan. Absolutely. Where you... 50, 57, 58, 59, 59. And so, so what value are you providing to the economic engine? Well, according to my wife, not much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm too kidding. Sorry. Sorry yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, but no, you, it's true. But right? then you end up, those questions end up being asked by bureaucrats. Well, I, absolutely. You're just a burden on the, on the system. Right. So, uh, yeah, which m makes government ask morally the wrong questions about life. So instead, they waste money on literally billions of dollars on all other, all other kinds of things, um, as opposed to... Um, but you can see it. The most vulnerable people in this are going to be the mentally handicapped. Yeah. Right? It's just... And anybody who thinks otherwise is a fool. A fool, right? And um, they already want you to abort your kid. That's why they want you to get all these prenatal testings to find out if, they, if they're Down syndrome or if they have these propensities towards illness and so forth, because that's going to cost the culture money. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's just, it's the epitome of evil, right? It, it's, it just completely extracts God from the human endeavor. That's the same thing that the Nazis did. Sure. They started with a public health regime. Sure, sure. And, but, but, you know, uh, Trudeau and uh, certainly the whole whacked out regime in Canada don't see themselves like that. They see themselves of as... Of course not. They're avant-garde, brilliant people, right? We're not as sick yet in America, but we're getting there quick. We're getting there That's quick. the same disease. But the, the really uh, thing that I find so disheartening is how Christians fall into this trap. And again, if, we, if you took a poll, you took a Barna poll and you asked a pew sitter across any denominational spectrum, if they found this acceptable, the majority would. They would. They're so disconnected from biblical and authoritarian teaching of historic Christianity because they just fall in this concept that they are the authority. How they feel is true. Even if, even if it's contradicted by the other 99 people around them about how they feel about an issue, they, they become the center of the universe. And, and uh, at best, God's an addendum occasionally that uh, they may call upon if if God comes through for them when they want want, want something right yeah it's it's it's, um, it's it's a very it's something I could say to you and, and a few other people I think getting chronic illness was a gift hmm. for me and that and it not nah, someday I have to convince myself of that but ultimately I think it is true because God's sovereign. Nothing, nothing happens that God doesn't know is going to happen in your life. And so it, it's made me, even though I'd been a priest for 20-something years when I got the accident, um, it, it's made me put more and more trust in God and in Christ. And in that, you, Mark Galloway, you are very finite. No matter what you accomplish, how smart you think you are, or whatever, how prolific an athlete you might have been, it doesn't mean a lot in the course of, of eternity. What matters is where, you, where are you going to be for eternity? Yes. And what's your relationship to the maker who's the same yesterday, today, and forever? And uh, when, when you have limitations that you never had before, you, you, you have to reprioritize. You refocus yourself into... Uh, actual reality, right? And so all the uh, the camouflage and the glitz and the stuff of life uh, moves away quickly, and uh, you have to deal with this concrete reality. So, um, and it's a just more powerful way to witness to your faith. I, I've, and as I already said, though, I've also found that it, it just makes people. People are far more uncomfortable with who I am now than I was when I was a vibrant yeah. young man. They just like they they want you to play the victim's fiddle, and when you don't, I'm not even sure they like you. No, I, by your actions, you're. I think you tell a lot of people something that they don't want to hear. Probably. Now, I, I think, you know, some of that's just natural disposition. I think there are people who just... Uh, You're such a quiet, agreeable person. Yeah, Mark. yes. I know. <laughs> and so, um, but it, it's, it's a horrible thing to give in to these things. It's, um, and I, I really want to go back and emphasize with the conversation around assisted suicide and MAID, I think our, our ire is much more focused, if not totally focused, on the people who are pushing and perpetuating this ideology and that we don't want to minimize this, the real suffering that a lot of people are going to, that I think what we're seeing is the marginalized and the people who are suffering being taken victim by those who are in power and pushing an ideology of pragmatism and removing the image of God, so to speak, from their lives and worldview, which make it seem as if medically assisted suicide is a viable option. And that's where this church and Christians need to step in and provide that voice, advocate for a positive vision of faith and morality and yeah. restoring that yeah, to the public square. The great deception and lie and why it's evil is because the policy 
is trying to convince you that this is good for you. Right. Yeah. But it's just the opposite. It's really what they think is good for them when you're gone, right? Which is evil. It's really what they mean. Exactly what they mean. And it's just, it's just, it's just evil. And uh, the, the church, Christians, people of faith, have, must speak up and confront what's evil and wrong. And this, unfortunately, there's less of us claim to be followers of the Lord Jesus who are doing that all the time. You know, there's just there's more capitulation than there is courage. I think the real moral cautionary tale when it comes to Canada is when Maid was first passed, public opinion polling showed that it was overwhelmingly favored by the public. It was like 80% favorable or something. And as it's progressed and as people have come face to face with the gross, dark realization of what it actually is, it's much less favored now. And I think That's it's true. probably less, it's definitely a minority now that really are in favor of what's actually happening with medical assistance and dying. But as with so many other things, by the time most people wake up to reality, it's oftentimes too late. Yeah. And we just have to pray that that isn't the case for yeah. Canada and certainly for our own country. Yeah. The inability intellectually and emotionally to any longer see or even perceive that suffering is good for you in life. I mean, it's so counterintuitive now that people are like, well, there's something wrong with that dude. He's even saying that, right? But, but suffering is good for you because without it, you can't get to the virtues of life that you wouldn't even have probably contemplated without the suffering, right? Um, it's like love, right? Unless you've really ever loved, you don't know what love is, mm -hmm. right? Um, w without human suffering as a believer, you can't even begin to ever appreciate and put in the context what Christ suffered for you. Exactly. Right? And so um, suffering is something Christians, if it's God's will, should embrace. Right. It unites us to Christ right. through because his Right. cross daily and follow me, right? And um, again, th th there was a time in our culture, certainly in my lifetime, when the vast majority of Christians would accept that. Mm -hmm. That's just not the case anymore. Right? They... Uh, Christianity is this feel-good thing where you go and it's like uh, you, you go to get your sugar cube on a Sunday to take away all your pain so your life can, you know, and then God will let you win the lottery on Friday when you buy your gifts, yeah. right? And um, it's just not the Christian faith, you know? And uh, um, so it's... It's a great challenge, I never, and I never downplay suffering, right? Um, it's great suffering in life, and some people suffered so disproportionately to others, and I don't have the answer to the mystery of that. Mm. It, it's a fact. Uh, we will know one day why. God's will is perfect. His sovereignty is perfect. Um, but the, here's the fact. It doesn't matter who you are, how well wealthy you are, how mighty you are, how strong you are. We are all immortal. We're all going to die. You can, you can uh, <laughs> reshape your face like Madonna just recently did and think you're, you're not 65 but 25. You can do all those things you want, but you're going to die. You know? So this, this whole avoidance of it is the most unhealthy thing in human history, is to avoid the idea that you're mortal and you're going to die. Right. You're going to live an unproductive life. You're not going to be helpful to passing on how to live a productive life. The generations are going to follow you, right? And uh, that's what's so destructive in our culture is that generations younger than me don't even know how to deal with life because they don't even accept that they're going to die. And I think the denial of death is nothing new in the human experience, but a technological advancement has really accelerated and I think emphasized this idea within our collective reasoning that we can deny death, we can put it off through our own technological advancements, we can 
design artificial intelligence in order to right. basically upload our thoughts and our associations into the cloud. And so you could basically take who you are, an imitation of who you are as a person, download it into a large language model, an audio right. visual model, and have something for your posterity to pretend as if you and your humanity are still alive, right. Right. but perpetuated through technology. And that's really the hope for a lot of these people who hold to a pagan ideology of yeah. kind of like a, a technological eschatology, a version of salvation where there's like a oneness with technology, singularity, as yeah, it's called. I, I take, you know, we did the, the AI uh, conversation a while ago, but it's like, to me, AI is like uh, what cryogenics was 20 years ago. Yeah, right? like Ted Williams freezing his head, right. Walt Disney. You know, just this idea, hey, you know, eventually they're going to figure out how to bring you back to life. I'm thinking, you'll still be an 85-year-old dead guy <laughs> with a worn-out body, right? Even if they could do that, which they're not going to be able to do, right? Um, and this is what people put their hopes in. Yeah. As opposed to the promises of Christ, right? And... Uh, it's amazing, you know. It's I, I I always you know as a pastor I think about situations. I can remember I was at the ICU at Kent Hospital and it was a parishioner I'd known her for a long time. She was maybe seventy years old. Her mother was like ninety five years old, and she was just dying of natural causes. And she wasn't suffering particularly mm -hmm. outside of the normal shutting down of your body at that late age. And I I, I had gone into uh, the ICU anointed her, gave her last rites, and I come out, and, and, and you know that you know the ICU at Kent, right? She, yeah. She's she's sitting against the wall, down in like a fetal position, and I'm talking to her. I won't mention her name. I go, you know, Sally, what are you doing? Why? Why is this happening? Why? And I'm like, why what? Why would God do this to my mother? Why would He take her? I'm like, she's old, <laughs> <laughs> right? It. it I mean, the most basic reality about yeah. life, right? And this is a person in her 70s who claims to be a Christian who's been going to church forever, and her 95-year-old mother's dying a relatively peaceful death, and she's just a blob on the floor, right? I'm like, wow, that's not the power of Christ, no. right? And that's typical. It's not atypical, it's typical. It's an expectation that we're supposed to be able to live forever. Yeah, no, it's just like, you're like you think your mother's going to be about 220? You know, how long is your mother going to live to be? You know, you know. I knew her mother. She she was ready to go. She was she was tired of a worn out body. You know, so it's just it's um, suffering is there's nothing people rotten for more in life suffer aging and suffering. Right, so we live in this cosmetic fake world, right? Nobody's hair's gray, right? I mean, the pressure on women not to be their age, it's just, and the fact that most acquiesce to it, it's unbelievable, right? You know, you, you, you don't have a real face <laughs> every X amount of years, it gets transformed into something else and then you can't move your face because it's like yeah. full of plastic and filler. And it's just like, it's just not behavior believers should be engaged in. And again, as most of the things I say, that will make you really popular. You know, um, imagine if we used our resources, our energies, and our talents into all the other areas that actually bring mm. beauty and joy and wonder and glory to God. That's a great point. But we don't, right? We spend an unbelievable percentage of our resources on this idea that we can make ourselves immortal. And it's all a waste of time. We toil away in vain. We do, we do, and um, and it just it's just uh, it just ramps up with every not even passing generation, every passing month that I'm alive, um, something new comes along. And of course, technology is just driving it, driving it, driving it, driving it. And so, um, yeah, I, my my you know, my pastoral advice just as a fellow Christian and as a pastor, it's like, you know, you're going to suffer in life. I don't care who you are. Something's going to happen to you. And the real, the real test of your character comes out in suffering. 
Not, not when you're making, you know, lots of money and you have a vacation home and you go to the Bahamas twice a year or whatever, and you get a Benz and you do all this stuff. That doesn't tell me anything about a person's character. How you deal with adversity and how you treat other people within the context of university tells me everything about your character. Yeah. Um, but that's, we're very shallow people, very shallow people. And because we're so shallow, we don't have high expectations of everybody else, anybody else either. In fact, people who have high expectations or live to them irk us. Especially if we've become so accustomed to having low expectations and living shallow lifestyles that we get shocked when someone comes along and has high expectations of us and reminds us that God has demands for our lives, that they're are requirements placed upon us through the Christian experience that call us to something greater. Right. A calling into the adventure and the growth that is everything that God wants us to be. And if we just spend our time sitting around scratching the surface, then we're never going to experience any of that. It's not really living. Absolutely not. You know, especially as a father, as a grandfather, it's pathetic. You know, what do you... So what are you telling your children and grandchildren life's all about? It just sucks? It's just this horrible thing you have to endure. And so, you know, just create this imaginary world to, to endure it the best you can. That, that's, that's, your, that, that's your legacy. That's your vision that you want to pass on to future generations. And quite frankly, it is. It's a philosophy of minimizing pain as much as you can. Right. Right. As, uh, Maximizing hedonistic pleasure. Yes, and um, so yeah, suffering is inevitable. Suffering is a gift from God. How we live and how we die is the most important example we can give as Christian believers. I think that sends a radical message to the world. I want to ask, <laughs> I think you touched upon this too, what's your advice for other people who have loved ones, family members, friends with chronic illnesses. What would you give as advice for the best way to care for those people to interact with family them? members of the ones with chronic illness? To, yes, your advice to the family members of ones with chronic illness. What's your advice to them? Well, the, the first thing I would say is you have to accept the reality of what has happened and that the person whom you loved uh, um, in the condition they were once in are no longer in that condition, and that you need to accept that. Now, if that's in the context of marriage, that, that it really is this simple. I'm going to love you in sickness and health, for rich or poor, uh, till death do us part, right? And, of course, that's another whole podcast. We can get into yeah. destruction of what marriage is holy matrimony really is, that you're one flesh and you're willing to die for this person if you need to. And so taking care of them is not a burden. It's part of your love for them. And uh, and it's not it's never one way. It's always reciprocated uh, um, in the context of, of holy matrimony. Um, the other thing is, I would say, is don't give... Don't talk in falsities to the person who has chronic illness. Mm. Like, Dad, you know, you just need to think positive and things are going to be better. Now, first of all, it's stupid, it's illogical, and it's not true. <laughs> think positive thoughts. Man. Right. Well, I mean, as you know, one of my worst, one of my things I hate most, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking about you, you know, they didn't want to pray for you. Let's, let's, let's think positive thoughts about this person. Send some positive As vibes. You actually can send that. It's just like it's like it's telepathic. It's just, yeah, it's pathological. But it's not telepathic, right? It's like yeah. So when you deal, you know, the best thing for somebody with a chronic illness to hear from their children, spouses, their friends is that they they accept what's happening to you. Mm -hmm. and they understand how difficult it is, and it's more as like, how can I help you? Yeah. Uh, live and deal with the reality of what you have. That's the best thing that a person with chronic illness can hear. But not false hope, not pie in the sky, 
you know, not that there's a magic pill you can take. It's going to take right. it all away. It's, it's all, in fact, it's, it's, it's completely counterproductive. The temptation is so strong to fall back onto pieties and platitudes to just say what you think people want to hear. Yes. And that really isn't helpful. And I think there's also a tendency, a temptation to, I think we already discussed this, try and impose what you think will be helpful versus like what you just said, asking a person what it is they need and asking what you can do to help and trusting that generally speaking, they know what's best for them. Obviously that's not always the case. Sometimes people who are suffering have many other issues that they're dealing with and they right. may not know, but for someone who's got all their faculties, <laughs> I think that's, theoretically. well, it's theoretically, I'm not speaking of you specifically, it's up <laughs> for debate. I don't feel pressure there. <laughs> but I think, I think that's really sound advice. Yeah, it's again, it's not really rocket science, is that um, people make it about them, um, in a sense. They, they, it's their own fears that come out. They're like, I couldn't deal with it. I couldn't deal with it. So, so they want to create an environment or an artificial reality that, so they don't have to deal with it. Yeah. Right. And, um, which just tells you how unhealthy they are spiritually. Um, and it's it's the worst thing for the person with chronic illness. Um, so, yeah, that's what I would say. Did I answer that question? Yeah, you did. Okay. And then the last question, I want to end on a note of encouragement here. What are your words of encouragement for people in a, a situation similar to you, people living with chronic illness? What would you really say to close things out? Well, if they're a believer, uh, and I think I think most of our audience generally is, I'm sure not everybody who listens to us, um, is that um, when you are chronically ill and you have, you know, so I, my day, I spend um, roughly six hours of my waking day just on my back, right? And so I have another six hours a day where I can do other things, right? In effect, sleep. I don't, you know, it's terrible. It's all, all of these corollaries that come with uh, uh, with it. And then when POTS kicks in, you know, as you know, this winter I was, uh, my wife was actually vacationing with my daughter and I was doing exercise, doing the stairs and uh, my leg gave out and I had a, I had a, some vertigo and I fell all the way down the stairs. Yeah. And uh, um, is that, in your prayer life, you can be offering up your situation as an intercession for other people who are, who are in this in this situation, and knowing that God can God always can use your situation for others, and that prayers are always efficacious for the faithful, and that you can offer your suffering in unison with the cross on behalf of others who are, are suffering and. Um, and become a part of that great myriad who are cheering on the saints, right? We don't have to wait till we're on the other side of glory to be part of the great witness of the communion of saints. And so we ha it's, when you have six hours on your back a day, uh, that's a wonderful opportunity to pray, mm. to reflect on how, how gracious God has been in all these other times in your life. Right? Or you can sit there and be miserable and play the victim and complain and like think you're going to outlawyer God. <laughs> yeah. All right. And um, it's a choice. It goes back right to the beginning of the conversation. You can quit on these things or you can continue to go forward trusting in the, 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 perf the perfect plan that God has for every life. And, um, yeah, time's never wasted in the human life. No matter what circumstance God puts you in, whether it's limited in your mobility or even intellectually. I have no doubt God uses people who are born with mental illness far more effectively than he does some of the most brilliant MIT graduates or RPI graduates yeah. or, or whatever, because they're, so, they're much more open. Uh, I've said it many times and uh, just from experience, the most genuine, incredible 
beautiful people I've ever met in my life are Down syndrome people. They believe. Same here. They have, they have empathy. They are no agenda. It's no pretense. No pretense. They're completely, they're incredibly generous. Honest. Yeah. And yet the world who doesn't believe sees them as uh, an abstraction, as burdens, burdens to the world. They're a gift to the world. And I've never met any people, especially in the abortion era, who have, have, have um, gone gone through by faith, even with the knowledge, and who haven't ever said to me that the birth of this child is the greatest gift to our lives, right? And it's all about perspective. It's all about perspective in life. And if somehow you think you should be exempt from any of this, that you are a, uh, you have an ego problem, you have a perspective problem, you have a faith problem, you have all kinds of problems. And you're never going to be happy. No. People like that, they're never happy because life never goes that way. And you'll never be happy. You'll never be rich enough. You'll never have the right relationships. Your kids will never satisfy you. Um, Nothing will ever, your job will never satisfy you. Um, and that's because the only thing that can fill that void, as Augustine says so powerfully, is, uh, is Christ himself. And without Christ, uh, this emptiness is going to pervade in your life. Our hearts are restless till they, they find their rest in thee. Right. And with Christ, we can, we can deal with any situation. And people think that's a platitude. And that's up to them to decide. But I would say that's the absolute truth. And that's true for the Christian and the non-Christian. Yes. Yeah. And the, and the non-Christian can't, unfortunately, the non-Christian, they, they never can figure out what's wrong because they think everything should be right in life. But we, you and I know because we are broken because of the garden, we, we, nothing's ever going to be perfectly right in life. So we look forward to the next world where everything is going to be right. They dread the next world, right? And they do everything to avoid it, right? And for those who may be watching or listening who are non-Christians, then the offer is, why not try Christ? Right. right? Pray to God, pray to Jesus, offer your suffering to him. Right. What do you have put, to lose? Exactly. <laughs> You might, you know, not see what might, he can do you for will you. Find the greatest lifeline there is to the human race is the you offer all free the gift of grace, much more than we can ever ask or imagine. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and it's joy unspeakable. When you once you once you you are possessed by uh, the love of God, you just will have joy unspeakable. And that's why people, even in the most difficult circumstances, can sing Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. As you know, that uh, liturgy ends. That's how we. That's right. That's how we commend people back to, even at the grave, we sing our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. I shall not die, but I shall live. And that's our message as Christians. I think that's a great place to end it. Thank you, Mark, for sharing your story with us. That'll do it for today's conversation. Friendly reminder to please like, subscribe, and leave a five-star rating wherever you watched or listened to this show. It means a lot to us, and it goes a long way to helping us grow this podcast. We look forward to seeing you again next time. God bless.